When I first met our next curator, she was tweeting so often I thought she was actually a bot. She runs a website, a blog called Brain Pickings, which is like the whole internet, but filtered for interestingness. And if you follow the links on her tweets and all her updates, you'll get pretty much all the media, all the creativity, all the updates that you need. So to curate the next session, please welcome Maria Popova. <laughs> So I want to start with a little clip from um, William White's 1980 film, The Social Life of Small Urban Places, which is the culmination of about a decade worth of research that he and his team did. And this particular segment is called The Street Corner. Plaza of the Seagram building in New York, late morning. With a time-lapse camera, we were testing a hypothesis. The sun, we were pretty sure, would be the chief factor in determining where people would sit or not sit. Now, just after 12, they begin to sit, right where the sun is. I was enormously pleased. What a perfectly splendid correlation. It was quite misleading, as we were to see later, but it was a very encouraging way to start. We were studying the Seagram Plaza because it was one of the most popular. Many people didn't think that it would be, but it was, and we wanted to find out why. Our research group, the Street Life Project, had been observing other kinds of city spaces. One was a block of 101st Street in East Harlem. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but almost every factor that later we were to find was important for a city space, we could have found out right here. The clues were right under our noses. So what does the street corner look like today in the age of data and the quantified self and connected everything? And are the clues to its secrets still under our noses? Um, in the 1930s, Lewis Mumford was the first to bring urbanism as a formal field of study into academia. And he wrote a book called Technus and Civilization where he traced as far back as he could how, certain, how societies used and appropriated different tools and why they adopted certain ones over others, and most importantly, how these decisions shaped these societies and these cultures. And then in 1961, he followed up with The City and History, which remains one of the most influential books on urbanism. But there's one bit in it that is particularly timeless and timely in the context of today. Um, he wrote, the chief function of the city is to convert power into form, energy into culture, dead matter into the living symbols of art, biological reproduction into social creativity. And in the late 70s, Marshall McLuhan, the granddaddy of media theory, followed up and he said, the quest for identity goes with bumping into other people. Now fast forward half a century and we have physicist Jeffrey West who studies cities as networks and as organisms. And he tells us that every week from now until 2050, more than a million people are being added to our cities. And in fact, by 2030, an estimated 5 billion people are projected to live in urban areas. Now, the population of Earth today is about 7 billion. And in less than 20 years, we're going to have 5 billion in cities. Now, that's a lot of opportunities for bumping into other people. And with those other people come their sensibilities and their beliefs and their politics and their technologies and their gadgets. And so the question becomes, where does this take us? One of McLuhan's other most famous aphorisms was that all media work is over completely. And that's been especially true of our communication media. In the past decade alone, those have changed enormously. And with them, so have we not just in how we connect with one another, but also with how we relate to our cities and our governments and ultimately to ourselves. And so this is what we're going to hear about today from Paolo Antonelli, Alyssa Walker, and Jake Barton, who all explore different facets of this evolving nature of the city as a platform for 
government, for health, for art and creativity, for self-expression, and for so much more. And with that, take it away, Paola. Good afternoon, everybody. As usual, in the past, we used to know much more about the future. You know, and once upon a time, especially in the 60s, late 60s and early 70s, cities knew where they were going. They were walking, they were like plugging in, they were sweeping over territories, they were metabolizing and spreading like mushrooms. All over the world, architects knew exactly what the direction was. It was about expansion, it was about a better life, a collective dimension to urban civilization that was meant to make everybody feel better about themselves and as a community. Even the beautiful work of Super Studio, these sweeping structures over nature that were supposed to make us live more harmoniously with the planet than we would if we would try to integrate, were really beautiful visions of a possible urban future. And even more recently, as recently as 2008, there are some future nostalgics like Greg Lynn and uh, Imaginary Forces and Alex McDowell that still imagine the city as this beautiful superstructure, infrastructure, planetary mushroom that develops and still think that it's a clear direction to go to. Instead, what we are left with and what we have to learn to embrace is ambiguity. Even after the dystopian science fiction visions of the 1980s and 90s, we have learned that the future can be both. It can be good and bad, it can be individual and collective, it can be regulated and tolerant, it can be what we want it to be if we can set some rules for the cities we live in. In the occasion of the one-year anniversary of the Occupy Wall Street movement, the sociologist Richard Sennett from the London School of Economics wrote a really stunning essay about how the Occupy movement had really zeroed in on the ambiguity of public spaces and helped urban, urban scientists and architects really understand better public spaces. And he wrote something truly beautiful that I would like to tell you about. I just would like to quote it for a moment. He said, said that the rights that nations give, cities easily take away. It's a beautiful way of thinking about what it is to live in cities. We think there's democracy, but the moment we start getting at a scale that is more urban and collective, we start having trouble. We start having to limit our freedoms. And you know, politics, Sorry if I sound like my big fat Greek wedding, but politics comes from polis, which is the idea of city from ancient Greece, which is anything that's bigger than a family mostly. So the moment you start being in a smaller space together, you start having to have regulations. And you start also to have ambiguity. And in particular, Senate quoted the ambiguity of New York and of London that the Occupy movements had to deal with. In New York, the ambiguity was between public and private space, because you know there are these, these laws in the states that um, mandate that if you build a new development, you have to leave a certain space as public. So Zuccotti Park was this ambiguous pu private public place that occupiers could stay in until they were kicked out, but then they won the right to go back in. So they were working with this. And here in London, the occupiers were working with the secular, versus uh, clerical space because they were positioned on the north flank of St. Paul's Cathedral. And so they kept on having this push and pull between secular and, uh, and non-secular. It was really quite interesting how this essay really made us understand that we need to know how to work at different scales and we need to find the boundaries between intimacy and collectiveness. And we need to really understand that there are many different scales to a city. Interestingly enough, in 2006, the Venice Architecture Biennial was run by Ricky Burdett, also from the, uh, from the London School of Economics, great architect and urban planner. And it was devoted to cities, architecture, and society. The scale was grand. It was beautiful. It was a big data orgy. It was like maps a go go galore. I, you know, graphic designers and visualizations designers loved it. And this year, 2012, six years later, David Chipperfield's biennial is instead about common ground. It might look like the scale is the same, but in truth, the moment you start speaking about common ground, you get to the intimate scale. 
And this is the US pavilion that I was involved in as an advisor, and it was called Spontaneous Interventions. It was this beautiful collection uh, done in as explanatory a way as possible of spontaneous interventions by citizens. For instance, you know, this very simple C-click fix, I'm sure you have a, a, a version here in England that is about seeing what's wrong, potholes, and you know, commenting about it and getting it fixed, or this great garden registry by future farmers in San Francisco that enables San Franciscans to let each other know if they have too many tomatoes. Do you want my tomato? I'm going to get your carrots. So it's about urban gardens and sharing them. Or this quite beautiful app that's called Derive, not Derive, but it's about getting lost in the city. So it's almost like a situationist app that lets you really take advantage of the city. Or even my block, New York City, which is a collection of one minute videos that are filmed in one block in New York. So you see, the intimacy is about really being being able to accept even non-scripted interventions. And uh, also in Venice, you know, the, the Golden Lion was won by Justin McWork, that's a curator here in London, and his urban think tank. They took the David Tower in Caracas, which is a vertical slum. It's a tower that had been built for a financial institution in the 1990s that were, was never finished, and that was taken over by squatters. And interestingly, you see the pictures here of the tower and the squatters. These pictures were taken by Yuan Ban. Uh, they took this David Tower as a metaphor of how we should build in the future. So the city of the future should embrace this kind of occupation. So the way urban think tank thinks of the Tower of David redesigned and really re-equipped is to leave that kind of vertical slum but bettered institutionalized behavior. And also amongst the spontaneous interventions were similar directions. You see here the beautiful walk, work of Rob Walker and Ellen Susan. It's called the Hypothetical Development Organization. It's an organization that takes fictional, I mean, real buildings in New Orleans and re-adapts them for new uses, very imaginative uses, and also sits, sits them on maps. So it's about imagining a new city that has new typologies that people have never seen before, but that we could embrace. Reading the city is also a very different way from what was done in the past. Maps have changed. Of course, you probably know about locals and tourists, which is maps of many cities in the world that harness, flicker, and position, you know, understand the data positioning and tell you where tourists and or locals take most pictures. So you have this kind of mood map of where the locals go and the tourists go. Or walking papers by Stamen, which is a way to uh, enter scripted, hand-scripted maps of the city with your own annotations and specifications and have them entered into open street maps. Or even completely aestheticized views of the city as these pretty maps by Stamen or even this beautiful swooping um, horizonless perspective of Manhattan by Berg that reminds a little bit Inception. So we've learned to manipulate the city to read it according to whichever kind of uh, uh, way in we want. This real-time Rome, this is from a few years ago, and it was measuring the, the temperature of the cell phone traffic and the uh, SMS traffic during a Madonna concert. Or even more beautifully, this is ambiguity over ambiguity. I just came back from Tijuana. You know, I always make fun of architects because they cannot say the kitchen. They have to say the kitchen condition, especially in the United States. But in this case, I really understood the border condition. So it's this city that sits on the border of the United States, but it takes three hours to cross the distance of 15 minutes. It's really a strange artificial boundary to a city that could merge into another. So really, cities have changed, and so has the way to read them. Cities always talk to us, and we talk back, and that was part of a section of an exhibition that I did last year called Talk to Me. This is a beautiful um, still from a video of Alex Gopher's The Child from 1999. It's one of the first videos that really used text in an architectural way. But the classical ways for the city to talk to us are through facades of buildings. I'm showing to you here Graz, the Kunsthaus, and then the Allianz Arena in Munich. You say there are two teams, and so the colors change depending on the team. Or even more classically, the way uh, facades can be manipulated. You might be fam familiar with blinking lights on the right, but what I really like is how that hypothetical 
project on top is a way for people to understand what would happen if the ocean warmed three degrees and New York were submerged until the eighth floor. So if you show it one night by really showing all the windows on the eighth floor lit up. Here in London, different readings also have happened on a very intimate scale. The Emily Reed and Chen Su have recuperated the hobo code, which was the way in which homeless people would mark safe, warm, difficult, dangerous spots for each other, and have actually spread it on the pavement, which is the homeless um, magazine here in London, and tried to recuperate this spontaneous kind of language through the city that is almost a sort of graffiti. And here instead is the study on graffiti that Evan Roth is doing in Paris and in London by taking single letters and making a taxonomy that he doesn't know yet where it will lead, but he believes will get us to a deeper reading of certain parts of the city. I like how everybody is taking the city, yes, as a platform to understand more about the city itself as something that is much bigger than us and also as a possible inspiration for the future. The work of Cecil Tolas is very interesting. She, um, she thinks of cities as if they were flowers. So to her, Berlin is a whole you know, beautiful orchard and she went everywhere in Berlin and distilled using headspace technology, which, which is used by the perfume industry. She distilled the scent of Kreuzberg and you see there a map of Berlin through the different scents of parts of the city. About us talking to the city, there's a lot of technology that is helping us both at the pragmatic large scale. Here is the new interface for emergency call centers that was introduced first in Philadelphia and then more recently also in New York after 9-11 when it was clear that the way emergency agencies were communicating with each other was a total mess. And here is instead at a very different scale something that you might know, Baker Tweet by Polk. I mean it was used a few years ago, I don't know if it still works, but it's the Albion Bakery near here that used to send tweets to subscribers to let them know that French rolls or brioche were coming out of the oven, which is what we used to use our nose in with in the past. And when citizens talk back to the city, you get this kind of visualization which was published in Wired US a few years ago, two years ago. This is a visualization of the calls to 311. 311 is the number that you call when you want to talk to the city in New York City and you get a person and these are the complaints and at different times of the day and night you can see that people are more upset about noise or they're more upset about you know like pollution so you see the annoyances of New Yorkers and what they want to complain to the city about and the idea of neighborhood and community has also changed in an interesting way and this is a glimpse of the present that might introduce the future. Babel Blocks by Boehm Design Studio represent the microcosm of the Lower East Side, at least the Lower East Side a few years ago when they used to have an office there. And it's beautiful because they made these like toys made of wood, like old fashioned toys, and then they made a lot of videos. You could buy the toys and they made a lot of videos showing the friction and also the harmony and the new mixture and the new languages that happen when people are just like squashed together in a closed environment. Southwark Circle here in uh, London is an experiment that is similar of building a community. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Participle. It's a social design outfit here in London. And in this case, it was about helping the elderly, especially those that had remained alone because they had lost their companion, recuperate a social circle using technology. So some designers help create that, spread technology, create some manuals and help people find each other. And neighborhoods also are sometimes endangered by the invasions that might happen from the outside world. This is gentrification battlefield. It never really became a game, but it was a trailer for a game. It was very funny, and it was set in Amsterdam North. And it showed, you know, you could choose at the beginning whether you wanted to be somebody living there or a hipster that wanted to colonize. And it, it showed, you know, you could get, you know, there was a building that was conquered by MTV. So it was about the gentrification happening and the hipsterization of parts of town that were original to themselves before. No matter what, 
as light subversion and the attempt to use the city in the way that is not really prescribed for is always there. It was there in the 1960s. This is House Rooker going around town with their mind expansion helmets and trying to capture the waves of the city. And it's still working today. It's interesting because sometimes these acts look more subversive than they are. It's about, you know, just projecting your SMS on the walls of the city. This is a work by Troika here in London. Or it's about doing graffiti by laser. Graffiti Research Lab used to tell me that every time they would appear in a city, even though whatever they did was not invasive, did not damage the building, did not hurt anybody, the police would come because graffitis were graffiti. Well, sure enough, when we invited them at MoMA to do a performance, they had to write, fuck you, snobs, you know? So it's always, there's a sort of nostalgia even there. <clears throat> about different uses of the city, this is also quite great. It's a student from the RCA that decided to superimpose the solar system, the distances from the sun, onto a Shoreditch uh, street, and then she went to every single store owner that was positioned where certain planets' orbits would be and put the owner in charge of a certain planet. So for three days, as a visitor, you were able to get into a store and ask the owner, tell me about Venus. Oh, tell me about Mars. And the owner was supposed to tell you about the planet. So ways to actually use the city differently. Or this is the work of Area Code from a few years ago. When they would have, you see how old the phone is, so you can realize when it was from. But you would have this uh, game on your cell phone, and for the love of God, you would run for your life in the streets of Manhattan, even though the skull that was trying to kill you was completely fictional. But still, it doesn't matter. You would fill in the gap, and you would really be scared for your life. Another way to use the city differently is to really go off and really do your thing. And I really love Ryan Rouse. These are Realities United, the same architects that built the interactive facade of the Kunsthaus Graz, that beautiful urchin. And I really love that they had this in their office. So another way to look at the city. But no matter what, what you see here is that the ambiguity that I think is so important does not mean anarchy. Ambiguity is not lack of regulations. It's the embracing of regulations that leave space for tolerance. It's about finding the fine line between democracy and entitlement. And Alisa Walker knows what I'm talking about, that northern part of California. And it's about really understanding that in order to be happier in cities, we need to find a more fluid space and a slightly less regulation regulated space. And maybe we will all be able to do this in the end, which is really the way I dream of using my city in the future. Thank you.